Hi guys, this is my module four for the KISA. Uh, my name is Aaron Walston. The one thing that I have is I live in Ohio, um, so I have to apply the KISA model to my school. Um, just a little bit about my school. We have about 1,800 students. We have two buildings, a K6 and a 712, and we're pretty rural. Um, we do have a lot of kids, but our district is actually the sixth largest in the state, so we cover a lot of area. Looking at all of the um, standards, when I was going over with my uh, with my administrator, Adam, he's my principal, um, we were looking at relevance. We, we thought we were transitioning in this one, some of our areas of strength. Oh, and feel free to pause it. There's a lot of words on here if you want to pause and read it, but I'm going to quickly go over things. Um, we've got our TBT, TBT is a teacher-based team. These are like our PLCs. We work together and we look over pre and post data and compare different teaching strategies. Um, at our high school, we have College Credit Plus. Students can earn college credit in high school, but, but the thing is, is those teachers have to have a master's in that subject area, and that's, uh, that's by the state. The state requires that. Um, we have enrichment classes this year to teach adult and college skills. We actually also have a student advisory board, and they cooperate with leadership, um, with kind of administration things. It's, it's very minimal, uh, but it is there, but it's pretty minimal. Um, some of our areas of focus, we just need to work on digital citizenship at the elementary level and even into the junior high and high school level with more of the ISTE standards. Relationships, we thought we, thought we were modeling with this one. Um, we do a lot, or well, he, he does a lot of collaboration with staff. Um, we do weekly PLC time, that's in our contract. Uh, so we, we work together once a week. Um, for me, it would be my math and science team. And then we have after school meetings twice a month. Uh, sometimes they're canceled, but I mean, it's there. If we need them, it's there. We use uh, teachers are required to go through the resident educator program. And this is for new teachers that go through a rigorous, you know, four year mentor program. And I tell you what, I was the second class to go through it. So I was, it was one group of people who went through it one the year before me, and then I went through it. Mine was a five year, and now they've changed it to four. It is a very rigorous program. Um, I know a lot of people that did not pass from the state of Ohio, and they said that they weren't good enough to be a teacher. Uh, so they had a, a year, um, like a probationary period, and if they didn't pass then, they could not renew their teaching license. Um, but we have at our school, and this is through the Resident Educator Mentor Programs um, for teachers, and that helps uh, helps guide those new teachers to where they need to be um, and due dates and um online uh, places where you can post things to the state. We also have for students mentor programs, counseling meetings, being 11 character trait program, uh, PBIS, positive behavior intervention system. For parent community, we do PTO, athletic boosters. Uh, parents come in, uh, teachers use programs like Remind or Class Dojo to talk to parents on a daily basis. I know I use that every day. Some of the areas of focus, we, we might need to do a little bit more research on more family engagement outside of what we do, but I, he thought we did a pretty good job, and I thought we did a pretty good job. Responsive culture. Our districts are very, or our goals are very clear in our district. They are, I mean, they are data-driven. They're percentage-based um, to get teachers up to that level. We use our TBT for, in our learning communities to try to help teachers get up to these standards. Um, another thing that was on this one, we talked about that uh, one of the KISA standards had to do with administrators advocating for policies. And he talked about how our superintendent will actually go to state meetings. And at these state meetings, he advocates for uh, policies that are actually practical. I know that a lot of times in Ohio, I don't know what it's like out in Kansas, but in Ohio, we have policies brought down from the state that don't make a lot of sense. So he advocates for those and then brings those to our DLT, which I'm on, our district leadership team. And we talk about policies at the district level and how those new state level ones work for us. We have district report cards, um, which I'll show a little bit later. Um, we always align ours to the standards. I don't know. I, I didn't understand. I don't know if people actually um, do align there curriculum outside of the standards, but we do. And common language, we have vocabulary strategies, teacher leadership is pretty much 
known um, that we have to do that. We have a school nurse. We actually have a nurse practitioner that comes in twice a month and meets with students. And then we have obviously the nutrition balance balanced lunch. Rigor, um, as you can see, I have the, our district report card grade. Uh, we got a B. You know, it's on an A B C D F scale. We got a B as a district. Um, in an, all of Northwest Ohio, you know, there's tons of schools. There are only two schools to get an A, and those two schools are kind of like an elitist school just by the culture in the area. Um, a lot of uh, wealthy. It's a very wealthy community, and a lot of money is dumped into those schools. So, so for us to get a B, that was really, really sweet. Um, so we talked about this. We we thought we were though in transitioning. Uh, we do have the College Credit Plus, and I talked about that. We do have a vocational school where we send students their junior and senior year of high school. They go to a vocational school, um, and then we have an engineering class in a, at a community business, and students go to that to learn more about engineering. And that's an entire class. I mean, that's not like a like a once a week thing. That's like they go there every day. Um, and we have about three kids that go to that from our school. Um, we have our district report card, our OTES, that is a teacher and administrator um, thing where administrators come in and they observe and we have to document nearly everything for an entire year of what we do as a teacher, parent contacts, emails, uh, data from the beginning, middle, end of the year. I mean, it, it is a rigorous, rigorous progress for a teacher. And if you don't pass, it's, it's not a good thing. You might not get renewed from the district or even your, um, or even your license. And one thing uh, that we need to look more about are teachers are some kind, sometimes confused on the resources that need to be utilized at our school. So we were going to talk about that then at our next BLT and then up to our, our building leadership team meeting and then our district leadership team meeting. Our results, we were also in transitioning. We felt um, the social emotional factors. We have our our programs. We do, he did say that we can do up to two years of preschool depending on the student's age. So that's kind of, he thought that was a good thing because if a student's not ready, they go to preschool again and then they go to kindergarten. Um, individual plans of study, this is one thing that he talked about that the state of Ohio is requiring high school students to get a certain amount of points and these amount of points, I, I can't, I couldn't remember and I wish I wrote it down, but there's a number of points that a student has to have and if they don't earn those points, they don't graduate. And points go for the end of the year exams um, and their college credit ready, their college credit plus exams. And those, they have to get a certain, pretty much a grade on those to get a point. And if they get those points, then they graduate. If they don't, they don't graduate and they have to come back. Um, and from what I understand, he didn't go into too much detail. The state of Ohio might be looking at some issues here in this coming year with that whole point system. And then our post-secondary we have, we had, that's just some data that I got off of our um, ODE, our Ohio Department of Education website. Um, after going through all of this, I was kind of thinking back on Adam's uh, principal leadership. I felt that he he's like a situational leadership. Sometimes he is the laissez-faire leadership strategy. Um, he really he reminds us we're all professionals. We should be able to get the job done. Um, he goes with that. He gives us our goals, pushes us to achieve these goals. And if you're not working to achieve those goals, he does go in and he does guide you to what you need to be doing. And he's kind of a democratic leader. He asks for input, but he does make that final decision in the end. But the thing is, is what I did notice is he's always creating a positive environment. Like even in staff meetings, he starts with the positives. It's always start with a positive, and then he gets. Even if it's a negative thing, he'll take it and he always spins it to be a positive. Areas of improvement. Um, unfortunately, some of my graph got cut off, but definitely we need gifted. And I have to ensure instructional practice. Um, and what it is is we don't, we don't do gifted at our school, and that really annoys me, to be honest. And I made that clear to him in this meeting, but... This is something that I think we need to be working on. And as you can see, all in red, those are all of our identified students, but we don't have any receiving services. Um, and what I would think we should do, survey teachers of what they do, identify students more than just at our younger level. They get identified, I think, in second grade. And uh, that's it.
So we need to identify them throughout their college or their uh, school career because things change and students should be able to skip grades based on their ability level because um, we don't do that to hopefully push kids more. College readiness, this is another thing. Uh, you can see we got a D in this. Some of this has to do with sending students to our vocational school, so that did go against part of our grade, but um, the college readiness, we, we should be able to offer pay incentives to teachers because in order to teach that, you have to have a master's in that specific content area. So for example, we have a teacher at the high school, she has her master's in chemistry, so she can teach chemistry as a college credit course and students can get the college credit when they take that class. So if you offer an additional pay incentive outside of paying, helping pay for the college, then I think more teachers would do it and that would help out our district in the long run. Um, another thing is data-driven professional development and content areas. areas. Uh, I have here zero out of eight of our language ELA, our language arts um, met the state indicator. That's third through third grade through high school. And we could use that information with our TBT forms and teachers fill out pre and post tests and they talk about their strategies and we find out the best strategies. And then we can use that information to encourage professional development in those areas. Now, my principal was talking about how you cannot force somebody to take professional development in our district due to our union um, rules, but you can definitely encourage by showing the data and talking about how it's definitely best for the students and how we can become better. So in that situation, I would be looking at, um, with that data, encouraging professional development in the ELA areas.